Hey everybody, Hoosier Jedi here with another review for you. This time I'm talking the Riverdale episode, Fast Times at Riverdale High. And if you didn't catch it, this is a reference to a famous movie from the 1980s, uh, probably around 1983, 1984, called uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High. And it was one of the first really standout uh, high school movies of the 80s. And uh, there, there was a time there in the mid-80s when there were tons of these high school movies. You know, this was the kind of golden age of John Hughes and all of that. Um, I've actually seen uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High. I watched it years and years ago. And, um, you know, those high school comedy movies of the 80s um, were well, like primarily that comedies. Uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High was actually surprisingly dramatic. Um, I mean, they, you know, it had its share of comedy, of course, but uh, there were definitely some very dramatic moments, some, you know, some real serious real world issues uh, that popped up uh, in the story, and uh, people made some interesting choices. Um, I mean, flat out spoiler, I'll tell you, one of them was um, one of the girls in the story gets pregnant and she legit has an abortion. And you don't really see story, very many stories, especially in the 1980s, uh, where characters go through with getting an abortion. I was genuinely shocked that that, that flew. I mean, uh, the 80s were a time when the fundamentalism was having a pretty serious resurgence in America. So that was um, a pretty daring storytelling choice for the time, and even today to some degree. Uh, anyway, so let's get back to this episode. Mm, this is a, I mean, this is another solid episode. Um, not especially interested in the whole Principal Honey thing, especially with him butting heads with Cheryl, but I think they made, they needed to have her have something to do that was, you know, besides hanging out in a bathroom with her dead brother's corpse. Um, uh, Principal Honey is not a character I recognize from the comics. Um, yeah, I don't really have anything particular to say about him. He seems like a real character of the ridiculously unreasonable authority figure that you see in a million teenager revies. Um, yeah, uh, although I did like the fact that he kind of pointed out, um, you know, I don't know what kind of ship uh, Waldo Weatherby ran here, but I'm going to change it. And in all fairness, yeah, lots of crazy stuff happened at uh, Riverdale High. And his explanation of why of canceling the dance being, oh, multiple students were murdered the last time we had a dance. Uh, yeah, okay, that's actually pretty pretty good logic. I can't fault him on that one. Um, so yes, bringing somebody in who's going to kind of put a tighter rein on things at Riverdale High is actually not an unreasonable choice. So I think, um, but of course you can't have the principal be the reasonable guy in a high school story. That's just not how it works. You know, oddly enough, this sort of reminds me of that line from uh, Vampire the Masquerade's Bloodlines, where uh, Bertram Trung says, everybody likes to take shots at the man in charge. And he makes a really good point. You know, authority figures are often a deserved target of ridicule and scorn, but again, it's also easy to take shots at the people in charge because you know, they're the ones in charge. They're the ones with the responsibility, and they're the ones that have to make the dis difficult and often unpopular decisions that keep the wheels turning. In any case, um, let's go on. Uh, Jughead leaving Riverdale High to start at the school. I was at Stonewall. Um, interesting choice. I mean, Stonewall, really? Okay, uh, but an interesting choice. And it does sort of harken back to what we've seen in earlier seasons, where Southside High was considered a real garbage school. The poor kids in Riverdale really only had Riverdale High if they wanted to get anything that even resembled a halfway decent education. Um, not really sure where they're going to go with FP talking about Jughead's grandfather, but I seriously doubt they would have brought that up if they didn't, uh, if they weren't going to take that somewhere interesting. Um, and then I have, I don't, can't say as I know anything about Jughead's dad from the comics, so, hmm, interesting. Um, I was a little surprised that they would have him make the decision to go from, uh, no, not interested to full on going to the school over the course of an episode, but, okay, I'm always for more, less hemming and hawing about stuff, so I can, I can get down with that. And I love the thing with, uh, the book club where Jug Jughead is talking about Moby Dick and going like, 
they say like, well, what does the whale symbolize? And Shagya says, nothing. Herman Melville hated allegory. Uh, and that's kind of right there brings to head like one thing that I really never can get behind in literary criticism is that people are just absolutely obsessed with theme and symbolism. And not that discussing those things isn't without merit, but theme and symbolism are not the be-all, end-all of things. And frankly, I think they're pretty overrated. I mean, the problem with symbolism is most people are just flat out too stupid to understand it. So why waste time? I mean, Stephen King, in his book on writing, which if you're interested in, you know, the craft of writing is really, really worth reading. He basically says when it comes to symbolism, and I quote, this ain't rocket science. So basically, yeah, symbolism, nothing wrong with it, but, you know, don't be ridiculously oblique about it. Okay, rant, rant over. Uh, yeah, I just really have annoyance issues with people who really get into this whole literary analysis thing. It's it's something that's really chapped my ass ever since high school. Anyway, um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Oh yeah, of course, we kind of get the whole plot with Reggie and his dad. Again, the idea that Reggie's dad is abusive, not new information to us. I thought they tied this up in a neat little package a little too easily. Um, like, a lifetime of physical violence is not something that just goes away with a conversation. This sort of really feels like something, and it really feels like a dodge that we didn't even get to see what happened. But then again, I can't really imagine that they would, could write this in a way that would seem believable and would not really get people who have legitimately suffered that kind of abuse riled up. You know, again, people who do stuff like that, who physically abuse children and family members, yeah, they just don't stop after just uh, one little conversation. Although I did like the fact that Reggie uh, highlighted to Archie, I outweigh him by 50 pounds. I did hear one story once from a guy who uh, got a decent bit of physical abuse from his mom growing up. And there was one time when he was around 17 years old uh, where she tried to slap him and he just grabbed her hand and basically said, you try and lay a hand on me again and I don't care if you're my mom, I'm going to make you regret it. And it really dawned on her that he was a lot bigger than her and now no longer afraid of her. Again, that's just a story I heard from a guy, but still. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, so the whole plot with Kevin. Oh my god almighty. I mean, I get that Kevin is really desperate for acceptance and having someone he can really kind of connect to emotionally you know, relationship-wise. But this is getting really out of hand, and they need to find something else to do with Kevin. All right, because this is just making him seem like he's just hopelessly emotionally needy. I mean, I understand that desire for connection. All human beings have it. Kevin, as a gay kid in a small town, okay, that's an extra difficulty for him. But, yeah, Kevin needs to move past this, and the writers need to move past this. We need to find something else to do with Kevin. Um, I did like that Betty did not cut him any slack on the whole, hey, you kind of helped drag me off t to where a guy was going to try and give me a lobotomy. Yeah, Betty's got some pretty legit reasons to be pissed at Kevin. But again, this is somebody who's been her one of her closest, her best friend, essentially, for a long time. And it really does speak well to Betty's character that she's willing to forgive Kevin, at least, or to at least give Kevin another chance. Kevin doesn't handle it especially well, but it does speak well of Betty that she's willing to give somebody who's done something like that to her another shot. And I guess you can kind of understand, you know, emotion, being in people making bad choices while emotionally messed up. She's certainly done plenty of that. Um, you know, the whole uh, thing with Chick. Uh, but anyway, let's see. Um, nothing especially strong to say about Archie, but I did like that he was willing to confront Reggie's dad. I wish I wish Archie had pressed on that a little bit more and said, like, hey, man, uh, you know, you got the guts to pop me one in the face. I'm not your son. See, do it and see what happens. Uh, also kind of like Archie, uh, you know, kind of, being there as a bud for Mad Dog, or for um, Monroe, I guess I should say. 
Um, interest. I'm kind of interested. I'm again. I'm I'm interested to see where that goes because that's really one of those times where you're really getting to see the best side of Archie. I mean, Archie in the comics is classically kind of a dumbass and a little bit selfish, but at the end of the day, he's also like the buddy that will always be there for you. You know, and that's kind of always been Archie's great redeeming quality. Yeah, he's kind of a dumbass, and sometimes he can be selfish or clueless, but he will never let a friend down if he can do if he can possibly help it, because his friends and his family mean everything to him. Just like his dad. Go, Archie. Um, Veronica's choice about uh, distancing herself from her family in the way that she did and switching to her mom's maiden name. Okay, interesting, interesting. Uh, I do like that she's gunning for Harvard because, um, you know, Veronica is right up there with Jughead and being one of the smartest people in the room. Um, this is all going to end in tears, though. I mean, there's just no way that Hiram is gonna pass up a chance to screw with Veronica for throwing him under the bus like this. And even from jail, you know Hiram has got to find, be able to find some way to wreck this for Veronica. I mean, just imagine that scene where she loses out on that Harvard scholarship and he just goes, well, you screwed with me, sweetie. Did you expect me to just let it go un unpunished? And did you notice he's, that's that painting of her that um, that she, he gave her last year is still floating around in the background of Bon Nui? I, I, I don't know, man. I'm still suspecting that there's like a camera in that thing or something. And we still need to find out who is supplying information to the rumor website. Also, one last thing. When does everybody in Riverdale have this, find the time to practice singing and dancing? I mean, seriously, everybody is good at this. I mean, Archie at least has some music background, but when the hell did Jughead have the time to, like, practice singing and dancing? I mean, we saw that in, like, the musical last episode, uh, last year, and then here it's, like, Cheryl and Veronica and Betty and, um... What? I mean, some nameless lady in the background? <laughs> I, I don't know, Josie was... Was Josie there? I think she was. No. Veronica, Cheryl, uh, whatever. I mean, granted, I understand that the cast has backgrounds in these things, and the show would be dumb not to make use of it. I mean, Grant Gustin on, uh, over on The Flash, they've made use of his uh, musical background abilities. Uh, the same with Nick on Supergirl. Okay, I'm down with that. Oh my god, it would be so cool if Music Meister showed up on Riverdale. I mean, it makes absolutely no sense. Oh crap, I want Riverdale on Crisis on Infinite Earths now. Yeah, I definitely want that. I mean, it's not going to happen, but oh, man. <laughs> oh, man. I'm t uh, okay, I, I need stuff. I need stuff. All right, all right. Um, anyway, I'm going to call it here, guys. Uh, thanks for uh, joining me. As always, please comment, rate, subscribe. And, of course, uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Who's Your Jedi. Until next time, take care and have a good one.